And my father, who retired a year later from the military, spent the rest of his life as a pariah because he called for the two-state solution and Israeli governments ever from that point to this day made it absolutely clear they will never allow it. And they created a reality, which of course makes it impossible. So I wanted to dig into a few key Zionist talking points that I see um, very often repeated, often kind of reflexively um, when the issue of Palestinian oppression and occupation is brought up. And those would be um, first Israel's right to exist and second its right to defend itself, which is related to the right to exist. Um, and of course, I know that there's a lot of people who are, you know, there's a lot of emotion and hurt and trauma around this topic. So I do want to be sensitive to that. Um, but I often see this brought up and um, really kind of just assumed and not really dug into and mainly used uh, to imply or to kind of shut down conversation and imply that because these rights exist, then whatever happens to Palestinians is either justified or just um, perhaps an unfortunate byproduct of the need to uphold these unquestionable rights. Um, and I'm actually a decolonial scholar here on Turtle Island. And so, I mean, I'm maybe a hard sell on some of these talking points because I don't think that Canada has the right to exist or the United States has the right to exist, right? Um, but for me, it brings up a lot more questions. So, you know, do all oppressed nations have the right to a nation state? Do, does that include the right to colonize? Like how far does that right extend, right? Um, and so I'm wondering what you think about um, these two points, like these two uh, rights and how you see them used in mainstream media. Well, you know, I'll, I'll stick to Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer to the question about whether or not Israel has a right to exist is a question of values. Um, you know, we have we have a 75, 76 year history, so we know what Israel is. There's no question about what it is and what it does and what kind of a state it is. Um, if people find that that is something that they can honestly say represents their values, that's the end of the conversation. So in other words, oppression, apartheid, genocide, violence, a deepest sort of racism, the erasure of another nation, uh, the total, you know, colonization of a country to the point where you change the name of the country and you change the name of the cities and the streets and, and you erase the, you know, if people feel that that represents their values then there's really that's that they can go ahead and support Israel, you know. If, on the other hand, in the case where people actually, you know, believe in humanity and equality and people's rights and democracy, then there's no way that, on earth that the state of Israel, which is an apartheid state, has a right to exist. No apartheid regime has a right to exist. Mm -hmm. No, 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 you know, no regime that. It, conducts itself and engages in so much violence has a right to exist. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no right or wrong answer here. I mean, I think I, I know what I believe is the right answer, but in but it's a question of values. It's not a political or religious issue. You know, it's like the, you can, you can bring it down to the question of, you know, the, the, the destruction of a hospital in Gaza. That was a big conversation, right? Hamas is under there. Hamas is not under there. There are tunnels. There are no tunnels. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Let, let's, let's let's keep it simple. Let's say the devil, the devil lives under that hospital. Does that justify hurting a single hair on a child's head? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. That's the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. That's the values issue. That's a values right. question. If you right. believe that it justifies it, that's it. Then you believe Israel has a right to exist. Right. And right. so that's really what this is all about. So I, of course, don't think Israel has a right to exist. And I think it's, a, it's, it's a, I, I, um, you know, I, I call for the dismantling of the apartheid state, as many others do, mm -hmm. establishing a free democratic state, free democratic Palestine from the river to the sea and putting together mechanisms to allow the refugees to return. Right. That, to me, is a recipe for peace. I want to see Israelis and Palestinians living in peace. That is the recipe. There's no other option for mm -hmm. peace. Racism, mm -hmm. violence, and apartheid never lead to peace. I don't think mm -hmm. you have to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quality tolerance does. Yes. Yeah, I think that, yeah, thank you. That's such a great answer because I think um, I often see this stated and then I'm trying to logic it out, right? But the logic doesn't follow for me because I don't share those values, right? 
because then if you think about, well, I mean, I know that a big reason for the justification for, um, I guess, a Jewish state is what people say, like the Jewish state has the right to exist. And the justification for that would be the Holocaust. And, you know, again, like I said, there's a lot of trauma and pain that goes into that. But, you know, we can also think about the Romani, like the Roma people who were similarly programmed across Europe, who were also targeted in the Holocaust. And nobody's really advocating that they have their own the state, but even if they were, you know, would they have the right to colonize another state to create that state? And if if yes, which that's already a big sell, if yes, would they have the right then if those people resisted to then, you know, push them into banty stands, restrict their food, their electricity, like how far does that right extend, right? But I think people just use that. That's kind of the core. Well, because that right exists, then all this, all these other rights exist, but at that point you're trampling over the rights of other people right so i think you're right like it if you when you try to logic it out it doesn't it doesn't logic <laughs> um but um as you said it is i guess based on values and also i think emotion and also maybe a bit of people operating again with different sets of information and different sets of stories about what really happened right but to me i think if it if this was recompense for the holocaust then surely the state that should have been carved up would be germany <laughs> right um, not a state that, you know, didn't have anything to do with it. But I think putting it in Palestine gives also people license to create a number of other justifications um, because of their religious history. I don't know if you have any comment on any of that. Well, first of all, connecting, you know, Holocaust survivors themselves answer that question because the vast, very few Holocaust survivors actually went to Palestine into what became Israel. Right. The vast majority of Holocaust survivors either went back home or went somewhere where they thought they would be they would experience tolerance. So to to claim that a racist militarized state um, is somehow an answer to the murder and genocide of any people is is it makes no sense. Right. That makes you know, no sense now. The, the largest anti-Zionist Jewish community on earth are descendants of Holocaust survivors. These are the ultra-Orthodox Jews in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. all, the vast majority of that community are Hungarian Jews who, who are descendants of Holocaust survivors. Their grandparents and uncles and, you know, came from Auschwitz. They survived somehow. Mm -hmm. They are the largest and most important uh, anti-Zionist, clearly, you know, absolutely anti-Zionist uh, rejectors of Zionism in the state of Israel on earth, and they're all Jews. And there are other Jews, Jewish, Jewish people who are not religious, who are survivors of the Holocaust and reject Zionism to this day. Sadly, not many of them are still alive, but you know. Um, so, I mean, they answered that question a long time ago, and, and the, the use, the cynical use of the Holocaust to justify Israel is, of course, the fact that people allow this argument to go on and give it legitimacy is absurd. Mm -hmm. you know, it's absolutely absurd, but again, it's part of this narrative where you have to say yes to everything that the Zionists come up with, regardless of how absurd the argument might be. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, the, the the planning for the genocide of the Palestinian people and the ethnic cleansing uh, began long before the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. the Holocaust and the creation of this uh, secular uh, colony in Palestine for European Jews had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Yeah, it is. Um, it is a powerful, um, I guess, tool to support Zionism because it's hard, especially for non-Jews, to say anything about that, right? So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, you just mentioned that you do support the one-state solution. So, I wanted to talk a bit about that because um, you know the Palestinian resistance has been arguing for this for a long time, or you know, sections of it. Um, but our Western politicians, our media, and even a lot of our academics, I see, are, are still arguing for the two-state solution. So, I'm wondering. Uh, why you support a one-state solution, what that could look like, and what it might take to get there. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know what the virtues of the one state of, of a two-state solution are. What are the virtues? I don't know. And how we get there, I don't know. So if anybody's willing to stand up and explain those two things to me, then I'd, I'd be grateful. I don't know. Now, I say this with a background, my father is one of the people who, who invented this idea of the two-state solution. At the end of the, of the 1967 war, he was still in uniform. He was one of the commanders who, the generals, members of the Israeli high command who planned the war, pushed for the war, and then executed the war. But at the end of the war, on the very last day, on the fifth day of the war, because it was a five-day war, it was not a six-day war. They called it six days to connect it to the six days of creation to make it seem like there was a miracle there. 
you know, the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish prayer book, six days of creation, six days, six days, you see that a lot. So calling it a six day war and it worked. A lot of people talk about it as though it was a miracle. But anyway, he stood up right after the war was over, still, you know, dust, the generals sat there with still dust on their uniforms and feeling all victorious and said, well, now we can make peace. We give back all these territories that we just conquered. We allow the Palestinians to establish a small state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and our kids won't have to fight anymore. And everybody else looked at him and said, what are you talking about? This was just finishing the job that we didn't get to finish in 1948. We left a few bits of our country, uh, you know, out. So we need, we took them back and we took them in and now that's it. What are you talking about? And of course, as he was saying these words, as soon as the, as, as, as the, as the cannons stopped firing, they began massive campaign of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from the newly acquired uh, territories and built massively in East Jerusalem and the West Bank for Jews only, massive cities and neighborhoods immediately. It's not like they thought, well, what are we gonna do with this? Maybe, no, they built immediately. And my father who retired a year later from the military spent the rest of his life as a pariah because he called for the two state solution and Israeli governments ever from that point to this day made it absolutely clear they will never allow it. And they created a reality, which of course, makes it impossible. There's no West Bank. Mm -hmm. There is Judea and Samaria, as they call it. And then there are these, what they describe as pockets of alien populations. These are three and a half million Palestinians who live in ghettos mm -hmm. in what used to be known as the West Bank. That's it. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the, what I said in the beginning, I don't know what the virtues are of a two-state solution. I don't know why Palestinians should accept it. And I don't know how, and if anybody wants to explain to me how they're going to go about it. And the thing is, the reason all these governments and all these politicians and others fall back on that as the solution is because they're afraid to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is, you either support apartheid or support freedom and justice and, and, and democracy. That's the truth. A single state over all of Palestine is the reality. That's what it is. It was a, Israel created a single state over Palestine. It's an apartheid state. So either allow the apartheid state to continue or you dismantle it and you create a, uh, a free democratic uh, Palestine. That, mm -hmm. Those are two options. Now, most politicians, sadly, the vast majority of politicians and public figures are afraid to say that. So they fall back on the safe so-called solution that they know, of course, has no chance of ever becoming a reality. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, we support the two-state solution. I don't know. You know, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you